It is my pleasure to be moderating today's panel, Course Correcting Your L&D to Enable Awesome Hybrid Training. Um, we really want you to ask questions throughout this panel, so please do use the Q&A module at the bottom as well as continue chatting away. So just to set the stage a little bit, um, the last few years, as we all know, raised the profile of learning professionals across organizations. And it also normalized the delivery of instructor-led training online. It existed before, but it became much more prevalent. And although companies are now returning to the office under some variety of hybrid working, learning and development leaders have found the benefit of using digital technologies to enhance training, increase scalability, and also for cost savings. But much like other departments, learning and development moved fast in the spring of 2020 to rework how they delivered training and learning opportunities to employees. And like other departments, in many cases, they essentially lifted and shifted existing approaches from analog formats to digital. So we're at a critical juncture. Reskilling workers remains a key challenge for many organizations. As we just learned in the Kahoot, 1 billion people need to be reskilled. But the patchy solutions that we set in place in 2020 remain for many people. So we now have an opportunity and an imperative to reassess and improve these approaches to continue to deliver business value. So with no further ado, I want to dive into our panel and uh, see where we go from there. It is my pleasure to introduce you to your panelists. We have Ed DeRosier. He is the Learning and Development Senior Consultant at Avenad. We have James Micklethwaite, Vice President, Kahoot at Work. And also, as you know, Lori Niles Hoffman, who is the Senior EdTech Transformation Strategist and co-founder of Niles Nolan. Welcome to all of you. Thank you. So I just want to kind of level set because when we talk about hybrid, um, it means a lot of different things to a lot of different companies. Uh, each one sort of interprets its own way. So when we're putting that in the context of instructor-led training, what exactly are we talking about? And James, I'm going to bring you in here to sort of set the stage. Sure. Okay. Thanks, Sean. Um, I think it's a great point and it's, and it's a good place to start. Um, as you said, it can mean many things uh, to different people and there's no one sort of definitive definition. Laurie actually in her talk earlier made some great points about how L&D is becoming much more multifaceted. So it could mean lots of different things. Uh, but I think um, for the purposes of this session, um, I'd like to suggest that we focus a little bit on uh, the location of the learners for live instructor-led training specifically. Uh, so what that does is it creates two scenarios um, that weren't there so much before the pandemic. The first you've already touched on is the fact where uh, potentially an instructor is delivering live training uh, um, to an entirely virtual audience. And then the second one, which is also quite interesting and creates some separate issues, um, is uh, where actually the audience is mixed. There are some people in, in a classroom uh, in person, and then there are some attendees remotely as well. Um, so uh, that would be my suggestion. But that said, uh, um, it, I'm sure we're going to have a fascinating discussion. Many of our customers that who like to say that they, they adopt blended learning pro uh, um, programs, so both live and asynchronous. So we don't need to be dogmatic about this, but perhaps we can start there. Absolutely. No, that makes sense. And I, I like how you spelled out the different scenarios uh, that people are actually tackling now. So when we're talking about instructor-led training, let's start with the location of the learners where they are all remote. Um, what are the specific challenges that arise there? And James, I'm going to keep on you for the moment. I'm going to keep you on the hot seat, and then I'm going to bring in Ed and Lori soon. Sure. Um, happy to jump in there because we we were super interested about this. Uh, you know, from from our perspective as Kahoot, we just saw overnight all of our customers uh, from using Kahoot predominantly live and in person to uh, you know almost a hundred percent live and remote. So it was a massive change. Uh, so we commissioned a bunch of research uh, about this actually, and so um, for when all uh, the participants are remote. Um, what in a nutshell uh, engagement uh, is the challenge? I talked about it right up front at the beginning of the day, but um, uh, in our workplace culture report uh, for 2022, uh, which is available for free online if anyone wants to, to check it out, what we discovered was um, a, a pretty significant uh, um, engagement problem with online training. So the proportion of people when we surveyed them who reported that they were very often completely mentally disengaged during online training is almost double that of in-person training. So uh, there's a, an engagement problem, which is significantly more acute than 
in the old days when it was all in person. And uh, it, as a result of that, um, distraction is a, a real issue. So we also did it. So it's kind of fun, actually. We got some extraordinary stats back uh, about when we asked people, what are you actually doing? So you're bored. Uh, so what are you actually doing? And the, the tasks, the things that they're doing range from work related, which you'd expect. I'm multitasking. I'm checking my email. I'm on Slack with a colleague. Uh, um, I'm getting through my to-do list to uh, non-work related, which were slightly more amusing, like playing with my pet was the most popular, washing, exercising. Uh, and uh, then we had some honest people. These are the minority, but people literally uh, um, being honest and saying, I am uh, working on a side hustle was actually quite a, a significant uh, activity. And uh, some people even searching for jobs uh, or, or double dipping in a Zoom meeting. So actually in two Zoom sessions at the same time. Uh, so clearly not at all engaged with the content of either of them, because it's not possible to be in two conversations engaged at the same time. I did enjoy the finding that people were petting their animals, which I thought was potentially beneficial for the learning experience <laughs> in that they were more relaxed. They were sort of taking it in a little bit more. So, um, Lori, I want to bring you in here and I want to talk a little bit about how employee expectations have changed over the last few years. I think that um, across the board, employees during the last few years have honestly become more vocal in what mm -hmm. they want, what they want to see. And how have you seen this impact specifically in the area of training? Well, it's been very, very interesting. Um, I think one of the big areas, the big things that employees are expecting is a commercial grade experience. I think at the beginning of the pandemic, they were, you know, very much like, okay, yeah, we can get by with that. But now that threshold is so high because they are used to working with technologies that were able to pivot you know, during that time and really provide these, these incredible experiences. We don't always have those on some, uh, like our learning management system, let's be honest, is not usually a very good experience. So that threshold um, has, has certainly, certainly gone quite a bit higher. I think there are also concerns to uh, people have changed in terms of what their work identity is and and what their personal identity is because we've seen the the overflow of, and the blending of the two you know people taking calls from their bedroom or from their garden or you know those things so so that that idea of identity has has started to to shift and, and evolve one of the big things though I also love that's happened over the past few years is really uh, because we all got reduced to squares on a screen um, the concept of the introverts, the extroverts, there was a real power shift. So sometimes people who needed more time to, you know, think about their responses or maybe responding in English as a second language or any of those sorts of things, we started to see a shift in power. It wasn't the person who took the power seat at the front of the room and commanded attention. There was a lot of uh, um, egality happening. Um, and I found that to be very interesting. And so some, a lot of the power dynamics shifted. And I think that that's a very interesting shift here in the training space. So Ed, it's um, it's your turn on the hot seat now. I want to bring you in because I know that you saw a fairly, um, you had a fairly dramatic story of a turnaround in your training that went over the last few years where you went from not necessarily the most successful online training to a success story. So I was hoping that you could just sort of introduce that a little bit and we'll actually tease that out a little bit more as we go along in this panel. So what we found, you know, what James was saying was an engagement. So we would have an online training program. Our employees were connecting from all over the world and they would slowly drop off and just not complete the task. They did not understand what the task was and how important it was to get certified in an industry certification at the end of the training. So what we ended up doing was we had to engage our learning like Lori ended indicated. So we ended up going through when we gamified things. We went through when we created characters. You don't have to turn on your video, but now we have characters, we have emojis, we have all kinds of different ways to participate. So even if you're not comfortable on screen, you can still see your name on that leaderboard. You can see that, you know, that acronym or the nickname. So to make it a little bit more fun and entertaining and no one knows who it is, until they, re, you know, maybe, re, you know, renew themselves and, you know, reveal themselves at the end of the session. So one of the things that we really saw was the engagement. As soon as we switched over our training to Kahoot, we were able to go through and have leaderboards. We had the instructors be flexible for when they ended their sessions. So if it was a time crunch and they couldn't make it through all the quiz questions, they could go ahead and end on a quiz question and then end on the leaderboard 
to call out the employees that were engaged in that session. So we had situations where people would drop off by the fourth session, going to Kahoot, and then having everyone engaged, having that report that shows that they stayed for all four sessions. So we had the KPIs, we had the ability to really judge the impact that we were making. I wanna ask, um, in this case, were you, which variety of blended learning were you doing or which variety of hybrid were you doing? Was the instructor in one place and the employees were all virtual or was it a online offline blend? Everyone was uh, remote. So our instructor was in one part, they were the subject matter expert, and then all of the students were from all over the world. So we try to do North America, Europe, Asia Pacific type of courses. So people were joining, they wanted to see their localized expert to deliver the content so that they could build up the community in that region. And so by doing that, now they had someone that they could reach out to, to continue to learning, but it was semi-synchronous training. We had them go through a learning path on their own time and they were expected to go to that learning path and be prepared when they came to class because we were gonna quiz them. We were gonna go through and talk about those high level concepts. So now the emphasis was on the student that they had to come prepared, no more sitting back and you know, kind of hiding in the background because we were able to go through and get the interaction and make it worthwhile because they had that expert there that they could ask that detailed technical question and get some really great responses. So um, I actually see some great questions coming in from our audience, and I want to uh, ask one now. And I think that I am going to ask uh, you, Ed, I'm going to keep you here, um, or Lori, if you can speak to it. Uh, do any of the panelists have experience in transitioning a regular remote student-led training to Kahoot training? And could you tell us more about the transition in terms of uh, converting the training materials and switching over? Ed, you might be in a position to answer this. Yep. So one of the great things with the uh, Kahoot was we were able to take our existing content and we were able to upload our PowerPoint presentation into Kahoot, but then we peppered it with all the quiz questions, poll questions, all the, you know, fill in the blanks and really make it engaging. So what I ended up doing was we designed it so that we would have 15 to 20 minutes worth of lecture, quiz questions, 15 to 20 minutes lecture. So they were expected. They couldn't sit there and, you know, kind of slough off in the middle. We were always having quiz questions and responses. And typically we would have a one hour or a two hour learning session. And Everyone was engaged throughout the entire session. We saw in the reporting that, you know, people were answering the questions. So we had some really good feedback, but we were able to import the current material, customize it, tweak it, you know, but add all of the great Kahoot features, you know, because everyone likes Jiffies. You know, we one of the rules that we had was you couldn't ask a question that a company did this. We had to use the fictional companies and then be able to use the jiffies for like superhero movies, you know, big blockbusters, because that was all embedded in the, into the Kahoot itself. So I wanna um, talk a little bit about techniques that have been proven for um, improving engagement during these online trainings. And I think one of the areas that obviously everybody's concerned with is motivation, getting the employees engaged, keeping them online during those two hour sessions, et cetera. And so James, I'm gonna bring you back in here and see if you could speak a little bit about the motivation. Sure, absolutely. I, um, again, that's a interesting topic for us uh, because uh, Kahoot is, is uh, we sometimes describe ourselves as, as a game-based learning platform, uh, which means that um, it's a learning experience, but it, it is actually a, a game. And so what you've seen, uh, um, attendees will have seen throughout the event tonight is a number of what I call interactive presentations, exactly what Ed just described. There's some slides and some content in there, but it's surrounded by uh, interactivity. But the key point is there is a beginning, a middle and an end because uh, it's, it's a presentation uh, and it's actually a competition. Uh, some of the some of the questions have points. And so um, we look quite closely at uh, um, uh, behavioral psychology and what drives motivation. And uh, depending on who you read, uh, um, 
uh, there are a number of theories out there, but essentially uh, the actual game mechanics of Kahoot, uh, um, uh, many people believe, and we see it with our own eyes every day, they, they actually uh, um, uh, touch some core human motivators. Uh, and some of those motivators include things like sensation. Uh, so that feeling when you get the question right, uh, when you're on the leaderboard, or that frustrating feeling when you get it wrong, that sensation. Anticipation is another core human motivator, which of course is, where am I doing? Am I going to be able to win this and end up on the podium? And then the other key one is, is, is the social, uh, so a sense of belonging. So what we, what we find is even if the content of a Kahoot doesn't matter very much, uh, but in the case of training, it does, people end up being super motivated uh, to come on top of the leaderboard anyway, because you get some recognition in front of your peers. And that's what motivates us as humans. It's an ultimately very human experience. So all of those things add up in the, in the Kahoot experience, we believe, to provide a really unique level of motivation that it's quite hard to find uh, elsewhere. I think um, one of the interesting things about instructor-led training or one of the benefits of instructor-led training is the group dynamics. Um, and I think that that is something that potentially in person, it's easier. You can easily divide people up, give them a task, have them work together, work through it so that they can own the knowledge better. And I was hoping that, Lori, you could talk a little bit about how this happens in this hybrid world of work. Is you have to uh, thank you for that question. You have to think really differently uh, when you are designing in the hybrid world. Like a lot of times, people do a lift and shift, and that's why I was really glad to see to see uh, Edward. You know, didn't just say we just put everything in a coat. You can't. You have to design for the media, and it's interesting because people, when you really start watching uh, them and observing them, they behave differently in a virtual environment than they do face to face. Right? People are actually uh, you are will will introduce themselves quite quite uh, quicker or they tend to norm and form uh, a lot faster in hybrid, which we kind of thought would be the opposite. But when you really start seeing, I guess people understand the immediacy of it. And also too, they start to treat it like they would any other social media platform that they're on, right? They're used to adding in a comment on an Instagram or a, you know, TikTok or any of those sorts of things, which we talked, which we talked about, you know, today. So I think it's it's keeping that in 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 mind and uh, in in the design. Um, but what I would also say too is that you know it gets even trickier when you have people who are on site versus is those on offsite and they have to form and norm as a team together. Uh, that becomes really tricky. You have to really be, be careful. And that really comes down to access um, and, and equity in how people are accessing it so that the people who are virtual are, are able to hear, see, do everything that the, that the people you know are, are on site are able to do that. Um, or sometimes you just have to divide up the people you know who are offsite versus people who are in, in there. But it's, it's, a, it's also a case of savvy uh, facilitator too, to pick up on the people who are being left behind in a hybrid environment, it's very easy to do that. The good thing in Kahoot is that you get a lot of metrics, you can see that, but when you're facilitating in real time, that's something you need to be extremely mindful of, that, that people aren't feeling lost because they can't hear the person at the back of the room because they're on a, on a camera. So it's being very intelligent about how you're designing things. And it may be, okay, instead of speaking, they, they're typing, they're doing this, like there's just different ways to, to put it together, but you have to be so deliberate about it. I'm so glad you brought up metrics, and I do want to return to that point in a moment, but I want to stick with you because um, one of the suggestions that's come up in the digital workplace in terms of having hybrid is having everybody log in to a laptop, even if, yeah. what do you think of that? I see your face, uh, and I, I think I know, yeah. but... <laughs> I don't, I don't like it because I don't think it necessarily even playing field. and people are going to people, I mean, they're going to pass notes to each other. They're already, you know, doing or whatever, and, you know, it, it's, I don't think that's, that's, you're, you, now you've just made it a poor learning experience for everybody, where if you designed it effectively, it didn't need to be that way. So I don't think that's necessarily uh, the way to go. That said, I also think two facilitators should experience what it's like to be virtual along with a in-person event like see experience a hybrid one and they themselves that's going to help their facilitation understand what it's like to be on the other end of the screen but no let's let's not not make everybody also to why go into the office and then sit at a laptop and dial in i mean that's just there's a whole bunch of wrong with that that's yeah that's a whole conversation that we can spend <laughs> another hour on exactly <laughs> exactly 
Um, so I do want to come back to the metrics question because you did raise it, Lori. Um, and again, this is uh, your turn, Ed, because I know that you actually benefited a lot from the metrics. You saw that dramatic difference. And I wanted um, to see if you could talk a little bit about what metrics you were using and how you actually used the feedback and the metrics that you were receiving from your employees um, to improve the training you were offering. So we were really looking at the reporting and the metrics based off of the instructor, based off of the participation for each session. So what we ended up doing was when we designed our course, it was a five-day course. So each session was broken out into its own Kahoot so that we had reporting for each interaction. We were able to see how many attendees were there. We were able to judge the instructor, the subject matter expert, also based off of how much interactivity was taking place. You know, but what Lori was saying was we also wanted to engage our employees at all hours of the day, keep the conversation going so that we didn't have to have a laptop. We we needed to make sure everything was accessible by phone. So we also had chat channels. So when they had questions, ask a question at any time from any device, anywhere they're at. So this really, you know, opened up the conversations and had our subject matter experts being able to discuss it. But from a reporting standpoint, the first several classes, we were going through looking at every single session, all the questions that were answered, you know, finding those problem questions, working with the subject matter experts saying, tweak this here and there. But what we saw right off the bat was immediate engagement through all five sessions. We started out with 50 people in our, you know, these are large cohort based style trainings that you know, I don't recommend for everyone, but those are some of the things you have to do when you're in a large corporation. So having 50 to 70 people in a cohort style training, you have to have that conversation going. And so looking at those reports, we saw a consistent 50% or 50 people participating in each session, no drop off at the end, having the metrics, the reporting, and then we tied that into Power BI reporting where we actually saw, did they get certified? That was the end goal. It wasn't to complete your class. We wanted to see that certification at the end. So separately, we we're able to go through and determine that we doubled the certification efforts just by making this change. Now, our goal is to get 80% certification. That's a high margin. You know, we're currently at the 60% range, but previously we were down at the 20s and 30s because people didn't know where the tools were to get certified. So that's where metrics can really kind of come into play. Are your learners engaged? Are they still showing up? And what's that interactive with the instructor? Because now we're able to see if the instructor is doing their job, they should have a high number of certifications based off of that class. Yeah. So I, I have a question in here from a listener who is asking, did you create those chat uh, channels within Kahoot? So no, I did not. So we are a, a large Teams organization. So we had a Teams channel. Mm -hmm. And this way, we had other subject matter experts monitoring things. And the other thing that it did, it was peer pressure. Because mm -hmm. once the first person passed the certification exam, they put it in the Teams chat. All the other people, you know, recognized them, applauded their effort. That meant the other students had to say, hey, I better get going. You know, I want that peer recognition. I want that review, you know, and then the instructors were called out for their efforts. So now the instructors engaged. They want to go through and contribute again, you know, because they're improving the overall tech community. And so now they have, you know, the ability to really see a benefit, you know, and, and get some goodwill and, again, recognize and reward the employees that are, you know, that are passing. And if someone's struggling, they're also able to ask for assistance, follow up with additional materials, and to address those needs, too. So um, keep the questions going. These are all been great, uh, audience, because I do want to leave a few minutes for your questions uh, as we reach the end of this panel. Um, but I want to bring in one final question. And this one, I'm going to start with um, you, James. And this is about providing and receiving feedback. Um, how can the instructors be best be motivating those people who are falling behind, as I just said, or who potentially do just need that extra boost to go? Like, what, what's the best method of providing that kind of feedback? 
Yeah, I think it's a uh, feedback's uh, um, absolutely essential. Um, I think it, it, it's um, for for Kahoot again. It goes to the core of the product. You've seen it. Uh, attendees will have seen it in today's event. Both learners and the instructor get real time feedback on how they're going. Now, of course, the trainer doesn't get personalized feedback until after the session, which you can look in the reports. So, uh, the, my advice would be. Uh, you obviously need to go with the group. Uh, you'll be able to see where the group is overall in real time as an instructor. And then uh, what you're able to do with Kahoot uh, is pause, uh, recap, uh, go over to take a different approach, explain it in a different way if the whole if the majority of the learners aren't with you. And then uh, uh, for targeted instruction and follow up with specific individuals, then the best thing to do is look at the report afterwards. And there you can spot uh, um, patterns. And what we find all the time with Kahoot reports is uh, trainers look for two things. One, they look for uh, questions that uh, either everybody got right or everyone got wrong, because uh, um, usually there's a problem then with the content or the delivery. And the second thing they look for is individuals who are struggling. And then uh, you follow up and uh, with targeted instruction on that. Uh, but the feedback is just uh, absolutely essential. And again, coming back to the game-based learning concept, that is the wonderful thing about games is that they are constant feedback all the time driven by data. Uh, so it's a very powerful and yet fun. You don't feel like you're being assessed all the time with Kahoot, but that's exactly what's going on. Mm -hmm. I, I'm curious, um, specific to this hybrid world of work, because part of what in in-person instruction handles so well is creating sort of a um, trust environment Yes. if you will, where it is this comfort level where people are all a cohort working together in a common space. How how do we recreate that in an online facility? I'm leaving this as an open question, whoever wants to jump in first. You really need to set up the environment. You know, you have to be able to go through and recognize when someone is asking for help, going above and beyond, saying, hey, here are some of the resources. Here are some of the ways that we can do it, encouraging them. So you're always trying to motivate people to do better, to you know improve. But if someone is asking a question and the instructor has to be smart enough to read between the lines. So there's always that you know gray area where it's like, all right, they're asking this. I think they're really going to mean that. How do we go through and give them the extra motivation to make them you know understand that it is a difference? One of the things that we did, you know, right off the bat was saying, thank you for getting certified because our employees weren't getting thanked. You know, that was a big deal with our employees that in order to be put, put on projects, to be able to expand their careers, they need that certification effort. So we wanted to be the first ones to sit there and say, thank you for going on this learning journey. And you need to continue that learning journey to be successful. Did you get responses from that? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. So, you know, because it's like once they saw that there were other people motivated and applauding their successes, you know, that's a, that's a big engagement from the tech community, because those are the other people that they're going to continue to work with and to be able to grow, you know, as they go through and advance their career. Mm -hmm. No, absolutely. Um, so I do want to jump into some more audience questions while we have time. I'm going to give you all a final say before we round out. Um, but just to jump in here, um, one question is, we currently have LinkedIn Learning for our learning program. We are a small company with limited resources and can only budget for one learning platform. I think a lot of people will be familiar with that position. Um, what would you say is the advantage of Kahoot over other learning platforms? And I'm going to throw that one first to you, Ed, and then uh, James, you can you can come in from the product side. So for, for us, it's a matter of when you're looking at going through and doing a design and you have to see which tool does what. So LMS is, you know, they're checking the box that you did your required training. Kahoot is really about the engagement process. So how do we go through and really take your training to the next level? You know, when we're doing this hybrid approach, when everyone is remote, you cannot do that push style training where you're just talking in one direction. It's just not going to work. People are not going to be motivated to stay with you and their attention is going to, like I said, they're going to be petting their dog and not following through. So when you're taking a look at some of these products, you know, you have to go through and emphasize LMSs do their thing. Kahoot is, you know, a great delivery for presentations and for engagement that it's that it's an addition, not necessarily a and or. So I'll leave it to James, though, for, you know, some of the other tech specs. Mm -hmm. 
Sure. And I, I'm, I think I'd say up front, uh, uh, first of all, I have a, a lot of respect for LinkedIn learning. Uh, and secondly, that you do need to think about, and, and Laurie would perhaps say something similar, um, you need to think about what problems you're trying to solve. So, so where are the gaps? Where are the skills gaps? Um, but I think where Kahoot is different from LinkedIn learning uh, is uh, that it enables, and Ed's going to talk about it more in the next session, I'm very excited, um, peer-to-peer -peer learning. Uh, uh, so it enables people inside your organization who actually know stuff that no one else in the world, LinkedIn, no one in LinkedIn can know, because it's about your internal company processes or intellectual property to both create and deliver engaging learning experiences. And that kind of content is highly likely, in my view, to be a lot more relevant because it's always updated. That No one will bother creating it unless it drives business outcomes. It'll be a team leader. I, I need my team to be able to do this better, to know the product better, to sell more, to deliver better customer service. So it's like to be more relevant, more up to date, and more useful fundamentally because it belongs inside the business as opposed to as laurie alluded to in her speech earlier a vast un unimaginably huge library of content which is very high quality content but the question is is can people find it and and do they find the time to find it and does it actually get used so i think those are the things to consider but that's the distinctive thing about kahoot is is this peer-to-peer -peer learning uh, um, that it enables i think and it helps people to create the content that's relevant and when they need it not too much uh, but the relevant content so uh, this next one is more of a comment than a question. So I'll just read this one out. Um, I think there's an opportunity to look at learning in a corporate setting a little bit differently. 15 to 20 minutes is a bit long because we are getting interrupted more often with instant messages, phone calls, and meetings. Uh, I highly recommend you check out Social Talent Setup, their learning platform, Recruiter for recruiter training, it's highly successful and different than traditional training and Kahoot gaming could be at the end of several short video format sessions. So that is just a suggestion from our audience. Thank you. Um, next question, it looks as if uh, we are going to go into copyright world. So with more integration into skills-based organizations, can we create, create Kahoots that we are able to copyright content instructional design as long as proper reference and accreditation is included? And James, do you have the answer to that one? Uh, so if I understand the question, are, you, are, are um, organizations able to create content uh, and copyright? We want to copyright the content instructional design within Kahoots. Yeah, um, we don't. Uh, the short answer is we don't provide a mechanism for that right now. We just have simple privacy settings. So you can choose to publish your content to the world if you wish, or you can keep it entirely private. So uh, we can help you with security, but with copyright, uh, um, not yet. I did. I did allude to the marketplace up front as well. It's not fully open for the corporate learning segment yet. More for uh, teachers right now, but um, that will uh, address this to some extent. In in that, yes, uh, you will create content. You will own the intellectual property of that content and be able to sell it on our platform. So that is coming soon. But as things stand now in a corporate learning context, we're not quite there. Um, so I have one more question. This one is about Kahoot stories. And uh, they're saying since the assignments may be completed at different times, the trainees are not competing against each other in real time. Is there a way to rank participants? There is. I'll take that one quickly because uh, yeah. they are you actually have a choice with Kahoot. You can, uh, in the asynchronous mode, uh, you can. Uh, um, and I think everyone uh, who attends this will receive the course and see this for themselves. So you can either have an asynchronous group experience. So you complete it at a different time, but you'll see the scores of everyone who's completed it uh, before you. And then at the end, uh, um, the host can uh, share the podium uh, with everyone who's participated. So that's an asynchronous group session. Similarly, some people prefer to learn on their own, and that's also um, great. And what Christian demoed earlier is, is study mode, uh, uh, where you can uh, uh, experience it completely by yourself and you won't see any other scores. So both are possible, absolutely, and you get the data. Excellent. Um, I am going to leave it there. I believe that members of the Kahoot team can potentially follow up on any remaining questions we did not get to, uh, because I want to give all of our panelists a final say in things. Um, and the question that I would say is, if you had one word of advice, um, or one, not one word, <laughs> but one bit of advice that you would share with the listeners for how they can improve their hybrid training today, um, what would it be? And James, you spoke last, so you're gonna go first. Sure, okay. Um, I think um, 
one thing it's always difficult isn't it um mm -hmm. uh, i think my my wand waving would uh, if i focus on instructor led training as part of a wider uh, um, suite of training it, it's to focus on what it's really great at uh, which is human beings discussion and interaction and not the delivery of of content so um, um it would be much less content which you can deliver asynchronously pre-read this just like ed was saying pre-read this before the session then we'll come uh, we'll do a kahoot and find out you know generate some really interesting discussions and dig into things uh, that is what i think that would be for me what what should change because unfortunately uh, we've come from a world where it was all it was all powerpoint uh, all instructor led training was mostly just slide after slide after slide and as we've discussed today as we've migrated both to virtual instructor led training and to asynchronous it all is it doesn't work uh, that that format doesn't work so that's my my one thing less content more interactivity and discussion in instructor led training so am I hearing that you're not a fan of the slide with about 20 bullet points that the instructor <laughs> then leads reads out verbatim <laughs> That would probably right. be accurate. <laughs> <laughs> so, Laurie, I want to bring you in. You haven't had a chance to speak in a bit. Uh, what would be the one thing for you? Uh, what I would say, I agree vehemently with everything that that James said. Um, but I'd also say, don't always assume your 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 experts are able to facilitate. Facilitation is a remarkable skill, especially in hybrid. Um, Pair them with somebody who can facilitate. Don't just rely or it, 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 you can try and upskill them, but really you may not have time for that. But understand that facilitation, having a good facilitator is critical to making this work. So don't just trust that your, your SME is going to be able to do that naturally because it, it, it'll fall apart. Training the trainers. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, and training the trainers. I've seen a lot of those go sideways. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, you know, but, but bring somebody in who can, who's an expert, who can do it with them if, if mm -hmm. this is a challenge. Absolutely. So Ed, it looks like you're going to get the final word here. What do you have to say? I would just say experiment and try new things. So, because, you know, like James was saying, you know, we have to get out of this push of PowerPoint presentations only. We want to make it exciting. We want to make it worthwhile. So experiment, try it out. I always use pivot if things don't work, you know, but you would be shocked to see what things really do pop, where you get those responses from the employees and that engagement really takes off. So always experiment, try new things and, you know, just make sure you have the analytics to back up the changes because that's where you're going to really see some of the great results. No, that's wonderful. I think that's a great point to end on. So I want to thank all of my panelists. Thank you, Ed. Thank you, Lori. Thank you, James. Um, thank you, the audience, for all of these fantastic questions. Uh, the future of instructor-led training online is bright, so feel free to experiment, and I hope you took something away from this panel.